one of the films that I'm working on is uh, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, which, wow. you know, which is a I fantastic love film. film. Oh, it's a yeah, fantastic great. film. It's so and, good. You know, and, and telling that story of the protests in 1968 it's just so relevant now with all of the movements, all of the protests that we've seen on the racial justice front, on women's rights, when, when George Floyd was killed and, and murdered, you know, and everybody took to the streets. Yep. So, you know, to think about the activists at that period of time in 1968 mm -hmm. that were protesting the Vietnam War that went to the DNC and what mm -hmm. happened to those activists, you know, being arrested and, and charged and tried. And now we see the same kind of activism you know, decades later. And I think that the film is really resonating with the, with the younger generation. Hey everyone, welcome to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast, where we highlight everyday humans doing crazy, amazing things. People just like you and me, who utilize their time, talents, and resources to give back, pay it forward, and make a difference. I'm Katrina Carlson. And I'm Jefferson Denham. We want to thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are on this crazy, amazing planet. We believe it's more important than ever to stay connected, stay positive, and stay active. Mm -hmm. And if you agree, you're in the right place. Oh, I agree, Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> so it's also the, that time of year again, uh, the time of the Academy Awards. Now, oh. do you ever watch the Academy Awards, Jefferson? You know, okay, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, we actually used to get together a pre pandemic and yeah. we'd have our little scorecards you know our voting so basically what we would do is we'd vote before the broadcast to see if our choices matched you know who won and uh, especially nice. for best I picture like or whatever it's fun it, yeah it was really fun of, yeah. unless of course it was yeah. the year where it was first la la land and then moonlight remember that oh yes that was, oh, that was the rough. intrigue oh, oh the suspense oh, no. hey 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 we're yeah. all winners aren't we Oh yes, yes. <laughs> of course. It's it's an honor to be nominated. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm sure our audience is probably aware that so much goes on behind the scenes of the Academy Awards and in the entertainment world in general for that right. matter. So right. today we want to introduce you to someone who behind the scenes is able to leverage the momentum created by things like films, music and so much more to make a huge impact in the world for good. And that person is Bonnie Abounza, our guest today. Bonnie has been referred to as the Wizardess of Oz. I love that. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> That's so good. Because when you pull back the curtain to many of the philanthropic efforts emanating from the entertainment industry, she is the one moving the levers to make things happen. She is definitely a crazy, amazing human rights warrior. <laughs> yes, she is. And we think you are going to love Bonnie's heart for humanity and the way she is able to champion so many great human rights causes. Mm -hmm. We are definitely excited for this. Definitely. So as you know, we're always looking to bring you the most uplifting and inspiring stories and practical information. So please check out our website at crazyamazinghumans.com and make sure that you are subscribed to our newsletter so that we can keep you informed and stay in touch. Absolutely. And on our website, you're going to also find content and resources that we've created to inspire you and help you become your best self. Because we really do appreciate you and we are on a mission to inspire you and remind you that you, you are, are crazy, crazy amazing. amazing. I want you to Today's episode of the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast is brought to you via Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All episodes are free, so make sure and subscribe today. Part one, Convergence in the City of Angels. Hey everyone, so we're here with Bonnie Abounza, who has dedicated her life to humanitarian work, human rights, and social justice advocacy. She is the founder of the Abounza Group, which develops and executes campaigns to help films move the needle on critical social, political, and cultural issues. Bonnie's work has brought hard-hitting campaigns and major celebrity engagement to issues as diverse as child slavery, environmental justice, 
human trafficking, girls' education, and much more. Her campaigns have raised awareness about other critical issues, including genocide with Hotel Rwanda and the Heart of Nuba campaigns, conflict diamonds with Blood Diamond, abuses by the food industry with Food Inc., campus sexual assault with the hunting ground, amongst many others. Right. Bonnie founded and was the artistic director of the Artists for Amnesty program for Amnesty International, raising their profile in the entertainment industry and the visibility of human rights campaigns with the public. Mm -hmm. As a consultant for the International Labor Organization, a United Nations agency, she assisted with outreach to the entertainment community. She launched the UN's artist engagement program, called Artworks, and has spearheaded numerous other programs. Bonnie has received commendations for her human rights work from the U.S. Congress and the City of Los Angeles. She wow. received a Global Champion Award from the International Medical Corps, uh, KCET's Local Hero Hispanic Heritage Award, Catholics and Media Social Justice Award. Bonnie, you're going to have to have a trophy room, I think. <laughs> and many, many others. Bonnie Abanza. Yes. Welcome to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. Thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here. Well, we are so happy that you're here, Bonnie. Yeah. I mean, I've had the distinct pleasure of getting to know you because of your work with the film, The Heart of Nuba, mm -hmm. featuring Dr. Tom Katina, who was our very first guest on this podcast. Remarkable, amazing human being. I'm glad you started your podcast with him. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So are we. So, yeah. Bonnie, um, we know you've been really busy of late because of the Academy Awards. Yeah. And, you know, you play a really important role in taking films with a social justice bent and then amplifying their influence in the world at large. So can you tell us um, how you were doing that with this year's films? Gosh, you know, there it's been a crazy year, right, with COVID. Yeah. And um, it's been a very challenging year on the awards front. But, you know, I think what we've seen with the films that are out there is there's been a real emphasis on these social justice themed films. One of the films that I'm working on is uh, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, which, oh, wow. you know, which is a I fantastic film. film. Oh, it's, it's a great. fantastic Movie. film. So and, good. you know, and, and telling that story of the protests in 1968. It's just so relevant now with all of the movements, all of the protests that we've seen on the racial justice front, on women's rights, when, when George Floyd was killed and, and murdered, you know, and everybody took to the streets. Yep. So, you know, to think about the activists at that period of time in 1968 mm -hmm. that were protesting the Vietnam War that went to the DNC and what mm -hmm. happened to those activists, you know, being arrested and, and charged and tried. And now we see the same kind of activism you know, decades later. And I think that the film is really resonating with the, with the younger generation to see those activists then and the activism now. And uh, to Netflix's credit, you know, they're using this film um, and allowing it to be used in conversations about the racial justice protests. And in fact, I'm working right now with them to um, set up a, a town hall that's going to bring in some legendary activists with some current day activists to talk about where we were in 1968, where we are now, and what's going to happen in the future. So um, that's a film that, that's truly resonating. I'm also working on uh, the documentary Crip Camp, okay. which focuses on disability rights and disability justice. And that's something wow. that uh, that's executive produced by um, Michelle and Barack Obama. Um, I worked on um, the project Athlete A, about you know um, the abuse of uh, the Olympic gymnasts, so there oh, are a wow, number, yeah, I know a number of these mm -hmm. campaigns that yeah. I'm working. On. I'm blessed to be working on such important campaigns. And that's why you know we're yeah. just so you know enthusiastically <clears throat> wanting to get to talk with you about all these things. But before we dive in further mm -hmm. to what you're doing now, right. uh, we are Katrina and I are just big fans of life journeys, right? Yeah. And how those journeys many times. Well, they inspire us and they lead us into what we become passionate about. And so, mm -hmm. so can you tell us a little bit about your background, your parents, yeah. your grandparents, and how yeah. they influenced you? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm the daughter of immigrants from Central and South America. Um, they, but my parents are from uh, Nicaragua and Ecuador, and they met here. And because they came from countries that had very repressive authoritarian regimes, you know, I grew up in a family that was very grateful to be in this country. 
with the freedoms that we have here. But they were also, you know, telling me, you know, cautionary tales along the way and never wanted me to really become engaged in protests because in their countries, mm -hmm. anybody that protested, you were arrested, you were tortured, you were oh, killed. God. Yeah. Uh, my grandfather, on the other hand, was a ship's captain. He was from Croatia. He actually helped Jews and Roma people escape from Europe during the war and he brought them for to our South audience, America. could you describe wow. for those who don't know what yeah. Roma people who are sure the the, yeah. the Roma people um, there are about anywhere between 10 and 15 million Romani people in Europe mostly in Central and Eastern Europe and uh, historically they actually hail from India and they came into Europe and they I, I mean I hate using this term because it's a derogatory term they're referred mm -hmm. to as gypsies mm -hmm. so when you think of the traditional sense of gypsies and how they've been portrayed in film and in books mm -hmm. Those are the Roma people. Right, and they definitely oppressed. Over, oppressed. Yeah. Well, they, they are the most uh, marginalized and disenfranchised people in mm -hmm. Europe now. And at the time of World War II, uh, during the Holocaust, they were the second most targeted groups after the Jews. Wow. Even and before the Catholics then, I suppose. Oh, yes. Wow. Yeah, the Jews and then the Roma. Uh -huh. and, so your uh, grandfather yes. was playing like, a big part in saving folks. He was. He was. And so growing up, you know, I... You know, I knew what my grandfather had done, um, you know, you know, coupled with the cautionary tale from my parents. But I was also named after a nun, the mother superior of a Croatian convent. So I, my parents wanted me to be a nun. That didn't work out. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went the other way. You a, I went you into habit. human rights activism, and I, I fully dived into human rights activism. <laughs> so I was sort of protesting in the streets at a very young age. Gotcha. Disappointment to wow. my parents, but... <laughs> You know, who, that's our who job. That's right. Right. Yeah, right? <laughs> I think in, in later years, they were very proud of me. But at the time, they were just very scared. And then oh. you said, I think uh, I had heard you say previously that your grandfather or your grandparents had bought a property in L.A. And then you guys all lived there together. Is that right? Yeah. So my grandparents had three daughters. And, you know, being Latin and Croatian, they wanted the whole family together. So they bought the first apartment building, actually, in, in Westwood and put us all there. So I grew up with my cousins in a neighborhood um, that was primarily white, and we were the only Latino family wow. in the neighborhood. Yeah. So okay. did you experience like racism? I, you must have, right? Yeah, I mean, I we did, and there were there were a lot of kids in the neighborhood, but there were two Jewish families and one Asian family. And we did. We faced a lot of discrimination, a lot of bullying. Mm. Um, my cousin and I were the tallest in the family, actually the tallest in the neighborhood. And so our friends who, you know, were these Jewish kids and, and this one Asian um, kid. And so they would run to us whenever they were being bullied. Mm. And my cousin and I would be their defenders. So, oh, wow. you know, started a started at age, a young age, right? At a very young age. That's and right. just, and fighting, and just fighting for, for those that were... They were being targeted. Wow. And like in your high school, you I think you said you went to a Catholic high school. And... I went to an all-girls Catholic mm. high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, there weren't a lot of, of, you know, minorities at the school. But I have to say that the sisters at the school were very, very progressive. And they actually encouraged our activism. Wow. And many of those sisters were involved, you know, in the sanctuary movement and a lot of these social justice movements. So... You know, that was, I mean, that was that was great that it, at, at that age, because I was a teenager and really started to dive into my activism full time to know that we had the support in high school that way. And, so and the Sisters you know. of Notre Dame and then also across town, the, the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart. You wow. Know, they were also very activist nuns. Wow. And did that influence you? Because I know at 15, you did your first sort of campaign, I guess you could say. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was a student leader in the anti-apartheid movement. That's and, fantastic. Uh, yeah, and, and focused then later on when I continued that work at UCLA, we focused on uh, getting uh, the UC system to divest its holdings from, you know, it was a very racist uh, regime in South Africa. So, uh, yeah, so to know that I had the support that I could go out and do what I did was really important. That is wonderful. And so, you know, growing up, who were some of your heroes that you really, you know, oh, looked gosh. to? gosh. You know, I looked up to Angela Davis. I looked up to Gloria Steinem. I, I looked up to Dolores Huerta. I always part, that was, you know, another, you know, big movement, you know, the, the farm worker movement and, you know, supporting their boycotts. So, you know, these women who are icons, who are legends, you know, in, in the social justice world, you know, they were the ones that I looked up to. Coming up, 
how life happens, challenges occur, and we pivot. Hi, this is Lenny D from Chicago, Illinois, and you're listening to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast with Katrina Carlson and Jefferson Denham. Hey, Crazy Amazing Humans. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure and subscribe wherever you get your podcast right now so that you're the first to know and you never miss our new episodes. Right. We're also on YouTube in case you'd like to see us and our guests at the Crazy Amazing Humans YouTube channel. That's where you'll notice, by the way, that Katrina's always having a great hair day. Me, not so much. <laughs> okay. All right. Now back to the show. Part two, from dirty dancing to artists for amnesty. When you were graduating UCLA, and what did you think your next step was going to be? How did you want? Well, to my dream was always to be a human rights lawyer. So I was planning to go to law school after UCLA. I graduated with an international relations degree. And for a number of reasons, including financial reasons, I had to go to work. And so I, I accidentally got into the film industry. Oh. A friend of mine was working at a company called Vestron Pictures, which did mm. Dirty Dancing. That's their, you know, their big hit. And she said, look, they're looking for someone to just be an administrative assistant. And I thought, okay, I can work for a year and then see about going back to law school. Didn't quite work out that way as, as you know, life throws us these curves. And I ended up getting promoted very quickly. I learned script development, you know, then I learned production, post-production. So my plan of one year working and then going to law school to be a human rights lawyer turned into 15 years <laughs> in the film oh, wow. industry. And I worked with directors, I ran their film companies. So, yeah, it, um, you know, I didn't anticipate that, but it was 15 years. And then after 15 years, I mean, I'd gotten married, I had my daughter, and I decided I really wasn't fulfilled. The movies that I was working on, which were, which were fine, were not really the kind of substantive films that, you know, really did um, challenge me. And, and Bonnie, if so, I may, can mm -hmm. I interject really quickly? So yeah. I know that you had said that around this time, after 15 years, mm -hmm. you had been married, you had a child, yeah. and then you were going through a divorce. Now, for our right. audience, we know, you know, these transitional mm -hmm. moments, these mm -hmm. marker mm -hmm. moments. Mm -hmm. And yep. I have a feeling that the upheaval of that divorce is never easy. Yep. Uh, probably got you thinking about other things. Would you call that maybe the sort of transitional moment that it was. It was you. at my point. Exactly. You know, I was divorcing uh, my ex-husband. My daughter, you know, was starting, um, was was in preschool. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what, it's just time for a change. And I just happened to be on the Amnesty International website one day because I've been a member of Amnesty since I was 15. And oh. again, this was, you know, I wanted to be a human rights lawyer and I wanted to work for Amnesty International. Mm -hmm. And I happened to be on the website signing petitions. And I saw this um, this listing this job listing where Amnesty was looking for an artist liaison, someone that had two to three years experience in the entertainment industry and someone who had knowledge of human rights. So I sent in uh, my resume, applied for the job, didn't hear anything for six months, assumed I just didn't get it. And then I received a call out of the blue wow. from Amnesty, from the communications director who said, look, we got your resume, but we think you're overqualified. Wow. And oh. I said, well, why don't you fly <laughs> me out and talk to me? So they agreed, and what wait, I wait, did... Wait, 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 wait. You said, yeah. hey, why don't you get me on there? Oh, you're dying, by the way. Why don't you fly <laughs> you me out and talk? To... I know, it was I pretty love bold. This it wow, was pretty bold. I love now, this. Thinking back, I thought, well, well, it worked. So, you know. Um, so what I did, and, you know, you'll appreciate this, back when we prepared binders for presentations and not PowerPoints, <laughs> right. so yes. back in the day. Yes. So I prepared this binder, which I guess was a pretty bold and cheeky thing to do now looking back. I prepared this binder suggesting to them that instead of an artist liaison position where they're just reaching out to, you know, a couple of artists to, to do some work for Amnesty throughout the year, I said, why don't you launch a program called Artists for Amnesty and look at it more as full engagement with the entertainment community, not just actors and musicians, but directors, writers, producers, agents, studio executives, you know, across the board right. in the industry. Why Katrina not and I were engaged? wondering if you mm -hmm. entered the office, you had this massive binder and just <laughs> plopped it on the desk. Did you do that? I, I walked in with my binder and, you know, I, I know it, it seemed odd because most people just, I mean, look, our resumes have been submitted. So most people coming in, maybe just bring a backup copy of their resume. I came in yeah. with a full binder. That's amazing. So Love I presented it. it to them and I said, I hope I'm not being presumptuous, but why don't you consider this instead? So wow. the long story short, they liked the idea and they said, okay, let's launch a program. I got hired 
to be the director of the Artists for Amnesty program at Amnesty International. So in a circuitous route, I ended up where I always wanted to be. Now, Not as a, a part human of this... rights lawyer, but you know, right. still at Amnesty International doing the human rights work we're bringing in the entertainment aspect. It's it's wonderful that you went yeah. full circle and got there to really what your That's original right. vision was. So many people don't get way. to do that. But I you know. know what? Isn't that the way life goes, really? Well, exactly. That and is life, right? We have to be open to all kinds of possibilities and left and right turns and curves. And and in the end, it took me 15 years, but I ended up where I always wanted to be. Right where you wanted to be. Now, there's a part of this story that uh, Katrina and I just love. Mm -hmm. And this is after you've been hired. Right. And uh, you said to them or whoever the person was that hired you, why did you pick me over yeah. everybody else? Could you share that little yeah, tidbit so, with us? So I, I asked her because I knew that there were a lot of candidates. And I said, so what was it that, you know, I thought, oh, my binder. <laughs> you know, I thought that's what did it. She said, no, you reached over the table. You, you, you know, you clapped your hands together and you said, what do I need to do to get this job? And she knew that. I was willing then to put in the hours and the hard work. And she said that was it. That's dedication, was, right? Yep. That Fantastic. I was willing to put in, you know, those. And and I ran that program for seven years. When we come back, Bonnie shares her insights on identifying needs and creating synergy to make a difference. Well, hello universe, and welcome to the Optimist Daily Update. I'm Christy Jansen. And I'm Summers McKay. We're bringing you reader-funded solutions news every day. We are sharing these solutions in a commute-worthy, walk-worthy, home office-worthy podcast. We share solutions on everything from green energy to impact investing, building community, and even baby animal births. Optimus Daily is not about rose-colored glasses. It is about the reality. And the reality is that we are where we are, and there are solutions and things that can be done to chart a better path. We also have captivating guests like social justice advocate Akila Shirelles and self-identified soil health geek Ethan Steinberg. Agroforestry, maybe one of the ways to think about it, either bringing the agriculture to the forest or bringing the forest to the agricultural field. And as an added bonus, you get to hear hilarious tales from behind the scenes and can't miss stories. Of course, we think they're hilarious, but you can listen and judge for yourselves. Sorry, Amelia, talking about the cat again. <laughs> Tune into the Optimus Daily Update on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. Hi, this is Rebecca from Los Angeles, California, and you're listening to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast with Katrina Carlson and Jefferson Denham. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, please make sure to write us at crazyamazinghumans at gmail.com. Part three, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. Let's talk a little bit more about, so you said, this is what we love. Katrina and I tell our kids this, and I think, Bonnie, you embodied this. You know, you look for opportunities and sometimes mm -hmm. you just create your own. So you yeah, saw a right. gap mm -hmm. in what they thought they needed. And you said, no, here's something I think you could really need. And that's yeah. how you created Artists for Amnesty. Can you tell us right. a little bit more how that worked, how the actual program worked? Sure. So what was surprising to me when I got to Amnesty is we remember the concerts in the 80s, you know, with U2 and Tracy Chapman and the police and all that, and, and all that support and... for Amnesty and human rights. Mm -hmm. What was surprising to me is that Amnesty never actually had these formal partnerships, right? you know, long-term. You know, it was always these one-offs, you know, will you speak at an event, you know, will you be part of a concert, will you, uh, you know, sign this petition, as opposed to a program that involved full engagement in our organization and campaigns. So when I had to go out and, and pitch the, the entertainment industry, I, I said, okay, why don't we put together an advisory board of actors and musicians and filmmakers and agents and publicists, et cetera. And so I put that board together and I turned to them for advice. And, and they gave me the advice. So what I then did is I launched a bulletin, which included amnesty campaigns, prisoners of conscience for whom we were advocating, uh, you know, global work that we were doing. And then I made sure that, again, back then we mailed things, mm -hmm. you know, went to all the studios and agencies and PR firms. And, and um, I went about town and introduced myself to everybody and said, look, we really want buy-in from your clients for the work that we're doing 
long term. And people understood that, you know, to in essence have these ambassadors that were ongoing on our campaigns. And then the other thing that I did, which which turned out to work really well for the organization, and they actually still do it, is before there were social impact campaigns, social action campaigns, we launched human rights film campaigns. Mm -hmm. So we reached out to the studios and production companies and said, if you have a human rights themed film, we have the built in audience for you. Can we collaborate? It would be a very synergistic relationship, and that's what happened. So when you know we were working with uh, MGM and Hotel Rwanda, they understood the value of Amnesty members who knew so well about the Rwandan genocide that we would be the audience for that film. And the studio was interested in us for that reason, and we wanted to use the film as a means of raising awareness with the public that were not members of Amnesty about our work. It's, and it's so we used, we used that film to raise awareness about the genocide in Darfur, and which, of course, you know, Sudan and the Nuba Mountains, you know, we know well about the genocides there. Yeah. So, and it was a very synergistic, um, complementary relationship that ended up being very successful because we were able to use the film to raise awareness with the public. And now I feel like that seems like something that people know about, but when you came up with this idea and you were innovating just this huge concept and changing it into a social impact campaign as opposed yeah. to just like a human rights film campaign, mm -hmm. you know, we, we now think, oh yeah, that's normal. But what year was it when you started doing just, you know, when you started there at Amnesty? Well, I started Amnesty, Amnesty was in 2000. It was in wow. 2000. Wow. That was... Yeah, you know, and the and Hotel Rwanda came out in two thousand three, but see, we we what I wanted was not just okay, let's just use this film and then a donation is made to Amnesty. Let's use this film and really raise awareness of people and mobilize them to take action, and that was the difference. And you know, you, you, you created a do that. you created a really big coalition for the heart of Nuba. I remember that. What is mm -hmm. the, what is that quote on that? Because I think it was the largest. NGO or something. Coalition, coalition. for a yeah. documentary. That's right. Uh -huh. I mean, we had we had the entire Sudan network. You know, we had the Human Rights Network. I mean, it was a massive coalition of of over seventy organizations wow. that saw the value of the film in 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 raising awareness about what was happening to the people in Nuba Mountains. Nobody knew, right? You right. know, right. nobody you know knew outside of the human rights world. You know, the average person didn't know what was happening, what, you know, Omar al-Bashir was doing mm -hmm. in the Nuba Mountains. And that movie really moved people. And the NGOs were able to use it in their advocacy work, in their fundraising work, which went directly on the ground. Um, you know, I know that, that you know, what, over $800,000 was raised just from that campaign, you know, separate yes. with Nick, what Nick Kristoff did, but from right. the Heart of Nuba campaign. Mm -hmm. And it really educated people about what was happening in a part of the world they had no idea about. Right. And now it's over a million dollars because it's yeah. still being played on, on various platforms yeah. and people are seeing it still. And of course, the hospital still needs help. So what you did there, of course, made a huge impression. Uh, and we had... Just, that and alone. as a documentary, you know, we showed it to Congress, right. you know, uh, you know, Ken went, you know, to Europe. I mean, we had so many screenings, you know, it was the right. first time that it was that that movie that was shown, you know, at The Hague. I mean, it was unbelievable the amount of, of these high level government and international agencies mm -hmm. that were showing this film, you know, to try and, and pressure then, you know, al-Bashir. To, to stop the killing of his own people. And you know right. what's, what's great about what you do, Bonnie, Katrina and I talk about this. So we are all, uh, dear audience, you know this to be true, we're all, it's a deluge of needs and yeah. information, and it just feels like you're yeah. drowning in information. So Bonnie, what mm -hmm. you've been able to do, this is your true talent, I think, oh, is that you. you're taking an issue that can be very cerebral mm -hmm. and can be very overwhelming, and you give it heart. Mm -hmm. The Heart of Nuba. And yeah. by the way, audience, I know you've watched that Heart of Nuba. Watch it again. Yes, yeah, it's exactly. so good. But so thank you. We thank you for the work you've done there. But I think right. that that's really the, the key, I think, of, of how you are able to create these groundswells of mm -hmm. activity is because you know how to get to the heart of it so that we don't just think it, we feel it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know in 2014, you launched the Abounza Group. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it, taking everything you've learned, I mean, what was your motivation for th taking that kind of direction and taking these you know, insights that you've garnered? 
Well, a after my divorce, I mean, since a single mother, and uh, my daughter actually grew up at the Amnesty International office. Her playground was the Amnesty office. Wow. And I always said that once my daughter, um, you know, was was in college, then, you know, I would... What I really wanted to do after, you know, my dream at Amnesty is I really wanted to now be on the ground. You know, I, I'd go to refugee camps. If, you know, there were humanitarian disasters, I would go there and take humanitarian aid. I've been to crisis zones. And so in 2014, she was she was off to Claremont McKenna. And I said, okay, well, maybe it's time now that I pivot a bit. And I had been uh, running philanthropy and impact for Hans Zimmer for five years. And then I said, you know, it's time now I want to see you know, going off on my own because it would give me the flexibility then to, okay, I want to go, you know, to Haiti and, and right. you know, and, and help out there. I want to go to Kenya, to the refugee camp. So it gave me that flexibility, but it was a roll of the dice because, you know, as you know, when you're secure in, in jobs, you know, and then you go off on your own to be a consultant and launch your own firm, it's a risk. Uh, I'm blessed in that I've never been out of work. Mm -hmm. And also when I started the Abounza Group, you know, we finally started seeing in 2000 when these campaigns started, this evolution of the entertainment industry fully embracing impact campaigns and understanding their value. So when I launched my own company, you know, filmmakers were coming to me, you know, studios, production companies and streamers started to come to me and say, you know, would you be willing to work on these campaigns? And so, you know, to this day, knock wood, you know, the Abounza group is very successful. I, I work on, I only work on social justice themed um, projects. And so I'm very happy about them. Now, my daughter is now studying for her master's in human rights at Columbia, and she'll be done next year. So who knows, I may end up pivoting in a few years and just spending full time on the ground and going wow. to these camps and helping. So we'll see. We'll see. You know, you had a little quote, and it was yeah. stemming from your through line, your desire to make the world a better place, and something that kind of sums up what fuels you. Could you share that with us? Sure. It's actually a quote on the back of my business card, uh, and it's from the Talmud. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. I love And it. that's just the guiding principle. You know, I first learned that quote when I was young and it stayed with me. And that's just it. You can't turn your back. You might not be able to fix the world's problems on your own, but you can at least help one person. You can do wow. something. That's Love powerful. It. And so that's the guiding principle. Now we know you just mentioned your daughter, um, yeah. that you're, she's inherited your passion for worthwhile Human causes. Rights, yeah. Katrina and I have daughters the same age. We they do. have similar passions. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like, and I'd, we'd love to get your input on this, seems mm -hmm. like there's a groundswell among the younger generation to embrace taking an active role and making changes for good. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? I love this younger generation. <laughs> I have to say, because I, you know, there was a gap there, of, uh, you know, a couple of generations where, you know, the emphasis was all, you know, money and fame and all that. And now this younger generation, you know, from, from the millennials to Y to, to Z, you know, they're, they've really embraced this idea of this quote where they want mm. to make the world a better place. These kids care about the climate. Yeah. These kids Hallelujah. care about racial justice. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> These kids care about racial justice. They care about equity. You know, they they're out there marching. I mean, when you when you know, we all march. You know, with, with women's march, right? Mm -hmm. And you see how many young people. You know, young women, young men. You know, I, I mean, just across the spectrum, marching. And with the racial justice protests, when I went out there with my daughter and her friends, I thought I was one of the oldest ones there. And I was so happy to see this generation hitting the streets like we did when we were young, because we want a better, more egalitarian, more equitable society. And I just applaud these kids. I bow down to these kids that they're doing it. And of course, they have the power of social media now, right? So it's much easier to, to mobilize and galvanize people. You know, back back in the day when we were, you know, fighting for the rights of, of black South Africans, we loaded up eight people in a Volkswagen and just drove, you know, to protest. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, we had our landlines and we picked up the phone and said, hey, join us, you know. And now these kids are just so, so tech savvy and they know how to mobilize. And I just feel more positive about the future because of this younger generation. And we see what happened you know, at the Capitol 
you know, and, and the insurrection is there. Mm -hmm. And the outcry of these young people saying, no, this mm -hmm. is not acceptable. And the fact mm -hmm. that they're fighting for Mother Earth, mm -hmm. you know, that they, mm -hmm. that they see, they envision a better world, and mm -hmm. they're doing everything they can to get to that better world, that better society. So uh I am so happy to see it. And that's great. And, you know, we're so happy to see what you've been doing all these years throughout Thank everything you. and so many remarkable things. And um, Jefferson and I are sure that you're going to continue to do so. But, you know, not everyone can really go full time in there and, and be who you who you are, do what you do with your connection and everything, but in re with regards of getting involved in, in both big and small ways uh, and participating in making the world a better place, do you have any suggestions or advice that you might give our audience about just doing those things? I think there's a lot that can be done. You know, I get asked these questions all the time. Obviously, you know, you know, younger generations like, okay, just tell me where I can go, you know, and yeah. volunteer, where I can go and protest. You know, how can I get into certain fields? And and you know, younger people they ask me, how can I get into an NGO and you know work in a nonprofit? So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I give the advice, but you know, I tell people, look, there's so much that you can do. If you're just so busy with your responsibilities, which we all understand donate to these organizations. Mm -hmm. These grassroots organizations are the ones day in and day out that are doing the good work. And they need our support. They need our support financially. They need our support, you know, as volunteers. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell people, look, you don't have to volunteer every weekend, but if you go just a couple of times a year, they they like the help. And it's really fulfilling yeah. when you're able to go out and help with these nonprofits. I tell people as well, you know, it's so easy now you know, to, to get a hold of your member of Congress. If there's something, you know, there's a piece of legislation, there's an issue yeah. that is really important, pick up the phone, email, you know, text, fax, whatever you can do, you know, tweet, Instagram, whatever it is, that is all really important engagement. Absolutely. You know, because it's the power of the people, you know, mm -hmm. to really move the needle. So there are a number of ways to get involved. I, I just received an email the other day from somebody who says, look, I'm retiring, but I really just, you know, want to do some good in the world. You know, can you suggest some NGOs where I just want to volunteer? So there are just so many different ways where you can just, you know, jump into it full time and, and be a full time activist or people going into the Peace Corps that, you know, are now retired and say, I want to go to other countries it. and help. You know, there's there's a lot that people can do. And I never buy the excuse as well. You know, there's nothing for me to do. Oh, yeah. Call me. I can tell you, exactly what you can <laughs> for do, sure you know, where you can go. And help. Yeah. Well, Katrina and I are big believers in, you know, as your uh, favorite quote uh, says, you may not be able to do everything, but you can do something. Something. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, just for our audience uh, who may not know, what is an NGO? It's a non-governmental organization. Mm -hmm. So as people know, it's, you know, nonprofits, yeah. But, okay. you, you know, you have right. those organizations that do advocacy work and those organizations that you know, do the humanitarian work. So, yeah, it's non-governmental organizations. Got it. Now, one of the things, Katrina, and I just love about you mm -hmm. is how you are constantly evolving and mm -hmm. challenging yourself. Yeah. So in that spirit, I know you, you have some new goals for the next phase of your life, right? Yeah. So what are those? Mm -hmm. Like I said... Um, you know, I'll, I'll probably continue in this space on impact for, you know, maybe the next few years. You know, I consult for the UN. They have great campaigns I work on. You know, I'm, I'm going to start working with some other big international agencies. But now that that impact work has been, you know, almost fully embraced and there are so many people now that are interested in it, I'd like to train some people on the impact side. I, I lecture all the time at colleges and the conferences about uh, impact campaign work. So I'd like to train some people. And then, as I said, once my daughter is settled, she's graduated and she started her career. And I know she'll either end up in a nonprofit or doing something you know, with the State Department, you know, Foreign Service, that's her trajectory. Then, you know, my next phase will be going on the ground more full time. Mm. I really do want to go uh, and work in refugee camps. I want to address the issue of gender-based violence. Mm. You know, I want to work with women who have been victims of genocidal rape. Um, I want to focus more on the education of girls because as we know, you educate a girl, you lift her family, you lift her community, you lift the country. Absolutely. So I really want to focus more on that. I support a number of orphanages around the world. I support a number of schools that are specifically educating girls. So I think that, you know, maybe in the next, you know, five 
years or so, then I can be on the ground full time. I think that's great. And you obviously have done a lot of hands-on. And I think I recall you saying that you have been arrested a few times in your day, right? Yeah, you know, I, uh, 13 times for civil disobedience. Oh, so that's one more goal, to get arrested the 14th time, right? <laughs> you well, you more. know, with the Trump administration, it's going, well, maybe there's a federal charge you know, <laughs> offering there. Um, yeah, you know, I, I consider it a badge of honor, you know? I mean, back when, you know, back in the day, I say, you know, that's, we were all getting arrested. You know, we were handcuffing ourselves to railings in front of, you know, college administration building. You know, we would, you know, refuse to move when we were told, you know, you have to go home. You know, this protest is over. No, we were all of that. Now, it was really funny as I was um, at a gathering last year, well, pre-COVID, and somebody brought up, say, well, you know, Bonnie's been arrested a number of times for civil disobedience. And there was an activist there who says, well, I've been arrested a hundred times. I said, you win. <laughs> hundred times? Wow. wow. Yeah, she was with Code Pink. I'm like, wow, okay, that's impressive. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, that's that's what we did, and we were willing, you know, to, to take the fight that distance. Well, I know that there's just no doubt that no matter what phase of life you're in, you're going to be doing things that make a difference, and you're going to go the distance with the same passion for helping others and saving lives. And we just want to thank you so much, Bonnie, for being with us today. Um, My pleasure. I'm all so that you do to stand up for people, make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your life journey with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I mean, this is, you know, a wonderful series. And, and you know, you have great guests, and I was just very honored that you even, you know, reached out to me. I, you know, I, I'm just built this way. This is the way I've been since I was a kid. And to talk about activism, you know, is just, you know, people are, are always saying to me, you know, wow, these are great stories. This is just who I am. And I'm hoping that any little bit of what I've done, if it can inspire somebody to, you know, like the quote says, just help one person do one thing, then, you know, I'm accomplishing something. Mm. You're in such a unique, unique arena. Honestly, I've never met anyone who does what you do. And so yeah, it's, you. we're just so blessed to have you. And you truly are a crazy, amazing human. Thank you so much, Bonnie Abounza. Thank you for, for having me on. Real pleasure. Thank so you. So great to have you. I want you to feel, I want you to So that's our podcast. We want to thank Bonnie Abounza for being with us today and as the Wizardess of Oz <laughs> for being a driving force behind so many important causes and efforts that make a huge difference in our world. And if you've enjoyed today's episode and you think it would be meaningful and helpful for someone you know, please be a crazy, amazing human and let them know about us. Right. A couple of quick reminders. Make sure to subscribe to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Mm -hmm. We've also filmed the podcasts so you can check us out on the Crazy Amazing Humans YouTube channel. Make sure and leave comments. We love to hear what you're thinking. Absolutely. And most of all, we want to make sure to thank you for being with us. Remember that every little kindness has the potential to create crazy, amazing human experiences one person at a time. And as always, this week, we want to encourage you to find one thing that you can do to extend kindness and love in the world. I'm Jefferson Denham. And I'm Katrina Carlson. Stay healthy, stay connected, and we'll see you next time right here on the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. I want you to feel, I want you to feel something crazy, crazy. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, please make sure to write us at crazyamazinghumans at gmail.com.